the blood of African people, the blood of black people in this country, it is fueling this genocidal maniac machine of the United States of America. One of the hard lessons that a lot of people have learned throughout this past year especially is that you can't really trust your government and those in positions of power to vouch for you. I would rather struggle than live a life of just being complacent under oppression. I'd rather die <laughs> than live a life uh, under oppression and knowing that I didn't fight back against it. There was a poll conducted by CARE in late August, I believe, where they found that in Michigan, 40% of Muslim voters were backing Stein. It's the Electoral College that is choosing the President of the United States of America. So in reality, we are making the choice. What did Imam Hussein stand for? And if we were to relate his message centuries ago to what's happening today, what is the Karbala of our time? I saw Shias searching for Sunnis to pray behind searching for Palestinians to pray behind. Mm -hmm. You know, so when people talk about the sectarianism and all this, I'm like, you you haven't seen what this is. <laughs> you see the, the, the exactly. level of love or the level of unity that uh, Imam Hussein, you know, uh, binds us with. When it comes to talking about those same people resisting or wanting to protect their land or reclaim their land, reclaim their narrative, it suddenly becomes, oh, you know, that's a little bit too um, complicated. We are dealing with the greatest enemy that our time has ever known. If we don't try to win, we will never win. If we don't try to become free, we will never become free. So we have to engage in struggle. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another episode on the TMJ podcast. Today we are speaking with Mr. Abbas Muntaqim, who is a Muslim new African educator, culture worker, and organizer who is also the co-founder and co-chair of an organization called People's Programs. He also co-hosts the Hella Black podcast, which aims to educate and inform on all things related to the Black experience. Thank you again, Mr. Monterem, for being with us today. I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. And I wanted to start off right off the bat with a topic that you've actually been quite vocal about talking about, and that is Palestine and Palestinian liberation. Um, and how there are many parallels that can actually be drawn between the struggle that Blacks have gone through throughout history, throughout American history, and the struggles that now Palestinians for decades as well have been enduring. Can we talk a little bit more about that? How do you think that these struggles are similar or different? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, thank you for having me. I think it's very important that we have this conversation, especially uh, with the ongoing genocide that's happening in Palestine the ongoing genocide that's happening in Lebanon, the ongoing genocides that are going on across the world, right? It's important that we don't necessarily uh, compare struggles, but it's important that we connect struggles, right? Absolutely. Because when we connect struggles, uh, we gain a, a stronger sense of struggle, a, a stronger sense of solidarity, and we are able to, you know, connect our forces and make them stronger. So when we think about uh, the black struggle, right, for freedom, for independence, when we think about Palestinian liberation, uh, the Palestinian struggle for independence, uh, we got to make those connections. More importantly, we got to look at it historically, right? Uh, because we we understand uh, the black plight in the so-called United States of America, we could also better understand uh, the Palestinian plight. If we can better understand the African struggle for decolonization, we could better understand the Palestinian struggle for decolonization and freeing the land from Western imperialism, right? Because uh, on the surface, some might think, you know, this is a struggle in the past 100 years or so, right? Right. Uh, that's been historically developed, right? Uh, but if we understand our history, specifically if we understand African history and African Muslim history, we got to look back at the Crusades. <laughs> we got to look back at the Catholic uh, conquistadors coming to the African continent, uh, colonizing African Muslims, enslaving African Muslims as a part of the war on Islam. Right? Uh, we oftentimes forget about that historical development of these colonizers uh, coming into the African continent, uh, waging a religious crusade against African Muslims to stop the expansion uh, of, is of Islam in Africa. Right. So as a part of that war, what they did is enslaved African people, brought them to the Americas, uh, created several colonies like the United States of America. Right. So when we understand this oppression and it's a hundred year, hundred year, a hundred year, hundred year plus struggle. Right. Uh, we're talking about 500 years of struggle of oppression. Uh, we got to tie and make that connection because if it wasn't for the enslavement of African people, if it wasn't for the enslavement of black people, the genocide of indigenous people, 
uh, in the so-called United States of America, America itself would have never became this imperialist superpower, right? So Absolutely. in many ways, uh, the blood of African people, the blood of black people in this country, uh, it is fueling this genocidal maniac machine of the United States of America. Some people might say, hey, Abbas, you haven't talked anything about the Zionist entity. Well, the, uh, the Zionist entity itself could not exist, cannot exactly. exist without Western firepower. It cannot exist without the United States of America. Say it, Hassan Nasrallah, uh, our dear Shahid, <laughs> he always would point, always would point to that if uh, the American bases ceased to exist in the region, that the Zionist regime would crumble, right? So if we make that connection from a, a strategic sense, we got to understand how are we going to struggle here in the United States of America? How are we going to connect our struggles between uh, black folks and Palestinian folks? Because uh, we're seeing a very, we have a common enemy. <laughs> we have a common oppressor. Uh, we have oftentimes a shared history. I tell people all the time, look at the map. <laughs> Palestine borders Africa, <laughs> right? Uh, so it's important that we understand the struggle, the historical development of it, um, so we can actually connect, connect it, so we can actually eradicate Western imperialism uh, from the globe. Absolutely, and I think on that same conversation, one a really important point that you've actually discussed before, and I think it's really key to bring up right now, is when it comes to any liberation movement, one of the pivotal discussions that becomes um, really important to have is the issue of role models and the leaders that become kind of the spearheads of that movement. Um, you have touched on this before about black history and how your history has been stolen from you. It has been whitewashed, uh, sanitized, as you have said, um, where, for example, figures now being celebrated are the likes of Barack Obama or Beyonce, as opposed to figures like Malcolm X, who in his time was seen as a radical or an extremist, um, which is really interesting because fast forward to today and we are seeing a lot of the same cherry picked kind of heroes or um, figures being praised in the Palestinian liberation movement as well. And we see a lot of kind of history repeating itself in that sense. Um, or, you know, seeing some leaders being uh, championed as the right ones because they are anti-resistance. Um, or, for example, a lot of it, unfortunately, coming from Muslims themselves, where they will say, oh, yes, of course, we uh, support Palestinian liberation. They will attend, you know, Palestine protests and everything. But when it comes to talking about those same people uh, resisting or wanting to protect their land or reclaim their land, reclaim their narrative, it suddenly becomes, oh, you know, that's a little bit too... Um, complicated, if you will. So why do you think that is? And what effect would you say that has on these movements? Yeah, when we don't know our history, we are going to uh, start from a playing field that we don't even know where it exists. <laughs> Essentially, we are uh, backwards in our way of thinking, backwards in our way of acting, uh, backwards in our way of being. If you don't have your history, if you don't know your history, if you don't hold on to your history, how is it possible for you to even know how to get free? people devoid of any history is you can't even really call them a human being in many ways if you don't know who exactly. your sense of self is how are you even going to understand your culture uh your history your history of struggle your history of resistance uh so i think you brought up a very important point when they talk about barack obama as i call him because he's bombed uh pretty much all of the world and he's celebrated as this uh so-called mark of black excellence when in re reality he's uh, nothing but a neo-colonial uh genocider in chief uh, who was very proud to drop bombs on his own people, very proud to drop bombs on Muslims across the world. Uh, but if we understand our history, if we understand especially the black radical tradition, especially in this moment, I, I think it's very important, especially for us Muslims across the world right. as well, right? Especially Muslims in America, especially as there's this uh, revival of a Palestinian struggle that we see going on inside the belly of the beast. We got to ask ourselves, who was one of the main uh, people who brought the Palestinian struggle into the so-called American uh, so-called discussion. <laughs> it was El Haj Malik El Shabazz, also known as Malcolm X. Absolutely. Right? After he uh, went on his international visits and talked to people all across the world, he ended up writing an article called The Zionist Logic. Right? Uh, so he was talking about Zionism in a sense that was in many ways pivotal in the time period uh, because this was a time period where you also had what I would call in many ways a Zionist control of parts of the civil rights movement, right? Right. Parts of the civil rights movement where uh, the Zionists were essentially paying off uh, so-called black leaders uh, to align with the so-called Israeli agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, so Malcolm brought it into the forefront for us. 
Exactly. If we understand that history of why he brought it into the forefront, it's because he had common sense. <laughs> Just because he was, was a man happening. of struggle, he was a man of principle, uh, and he saw humanity, right? Uh, so for us, I think it's important if we understand that history, especially as black people in America, our greatest revolutionaries, <laughs> our greatest, I consider Malcolm to be, uh, you know, the black black people's strongest martyr. He's our most beautiful martyr. Absolutely. He's our most beautiful shocking youth. Uh, you know, he led, he led a lot of us to Islam in many ways, right? If he was telling us that we have to be against Zionism, if we have to be against Western imperialism, that's what we got to be against. Right. <laughs> he, in many ways, he uh, uh, foreshadowed what is happening today, right? Uh, so if we don't understand our history, if we don't connect our history to this uh, tradition of black revolutionaries, uh, even if we look at the Black Panther Party, you know, they had a chapter set up in Algiers. Uh, you know, Eldridge Cleaver uh, was in solidarity and working with uh, Fata and the PLO and even, you know, sat down with Arafat. Of course, we know Arafat changed. Um, but at that time period, it was very pivotal in terms of developing a, the Black and Palestinian struggle, seeing it as a one struggle against the common oppressor uh, of Western imperialists. You know, even in the propaganda that the Black Panther Party produced, uh, beautiful propaganda that they produced, you know, they called the cop, you know, a pig. But who else do they call a pig? They was calling the Zionists a pig as well. They was calling the uh, Zionist occupation forces pigs as well, right? So understanding uh, yeah. that common commonality uh, over time, right? Uh, even if we go into the Black Lives Matter movement that happened in Fergus, where it kicked off and had a lot of revolutionary energy before, in many ways, it was co-opted. You had Palestinians uh, sharing, you know, essentially ways to be able to protest and to deal with tear gas and different strategies that they learned from Gaza. And why is that? It's because the the pigs in the Zionist army and the pigs in the uh, different police departments across the so-called United States of America, they is training with each other and learning from each other. Right. So we too must learn these different tactics. Right? Exactly. Uh, the head of Hamas, he spoke about how, uh, look what they're doing to Freddie Gray. Look what they did to Freddie Gray. <laughs> right. That's the same thing that the Zionists are also doing uh, to Palestinians. Same thing the Zionists are doing to the Lebanese. They're doing the same tactics. Right. So if we understand that history, we should understand that we have a common enemy. If we understand our humanity, we can understand who is for humanity and who is against it. We've got to be on the side of people who are for humanity and the Palestinians are for humanity. And we must be for humanity ourselves as uh, black revolutionaries living in this uh, so-called country. You mentioned the Black Panther Party, and I want to kind of pivot to the organization you co-founded, the People's Program. And I think that's equally important to talk about because I think there's lots of parallels there as well. But one of the hard lessons that a lot of um, people have learned throughout these this past year especially is that you can't really trust your government and those in positions of power to vouch for you, even if you know they're making these statements that sound you know very human rights oriented um, in you know in nature. But you really can't trust them because they don't have your best interest in mind. And um, it doesn't really essentially matter how much our people come out in the streets and protest, as you know, people have been doing for the past year um, in huge numbers. So and so many, including the Black Panther Party, I think, would be a really good example of this, where they took it in their own hands and um, really wanted to care for their people at a time when their government was doing just the opposite, um, to uplift them, to help them, to you know, at the same time challenge the institutional injustices that are affecting them, for example, police brutality, which you have also spoken about a lot in your podcast as well as throughout your activism. But you have likened a lot of what your group, the People's Program, has done to the Black Panther Party and the work that they did. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what that encompasses and what your group does? Yeah, so, you know, the Black Panther Party was uh, founded in Oakland, California, uh, in 1966, uh, in October of 1966, I think, uh, thinking about October and all the resistance movements uh, that had kicked off and made very historic uh, gains during this time period, I had also entered the Black Panther Party into that conversation. I think it is the uh, greatest organization that we have seen that has been the greatest threat to the so-called United States of America. Uh, you know, so there's a lot for us to learn from the Black Panther Party and their successes. Uh, as well as their failures. But people's programs, in many ways, it comes from the afterlife of the Black Panther Party. Uh, Jalil Mutakim, he was a part of the Black Liberation Army. He was also part of the Black Panther Party. Uh, he wrote a book while he was incarcerated called We Are Our Own Liberators. In that book, he talks about we need to expand past just merely the survival programs of the Black Panther Party, right, the free food programs, and we got to 
uh, evolve into decolonization programs, right? Because if you're just saying we're just trying to survive, that ain't no pathway to thriving, <laughs> right? Uh, so the wording and the, uh, and the intentionality behind it must be like, no, we have the right to free this land. We have the right to decolonize, right? So at People's Programs, uh, we are building in Oakland what we call decolonization programs, uh, programs that we can build our own independence. If we know that the government will not save us, if we know the government is committing a genocide against Black people in this country as we speak, we know the government is committing genocide against Indigenous people as we speak, what institutions are we going to build in our community that can move us forward towards decolonization, right? So we have a free breakfast program that has served over 70,000 meals. Uh, we have a grocery program that is providing uh, thousands of boxes of groceries to uh, different housing projects in West Oakland. Uh, we have a free health clinic where we're providing our own health care to our own people because uh, we can't be going to the enemy's hospitals if we're talking about a revolution, right? <laughs> we have a free farming program where we're growing our own produce, right? So essentially what we're trying to do is build our own independence and our own autonomy so that we can become, in fact, our own liberators, right? Uh, and we see ourselves, we have a historic obligation, a historic obligation inside the belly of the beast uh, to free the land from American imperialism, right? Uh, che, the great revolutionary, you know, he wished, he said, I wish I could be, not word for word, of course, but he said, I wish I could be in, in the United States of America. And why did he say that? Not to, you know, live a life of American extravagance, but because of the location of being inside of an empire, you have an ability to wage a revolutionary struggle, right? Uh, so I think we have to wage that revolutionary, I know actually, we have to wage that revolutionary struggle here inside of the belly of the beast. Uh, because oftentimes we can protest, protest, protest. We can yell at the enemy, but what is that actually doing? Right. right? Look at the resistant movements, you know, across West Asia, across Africa. What are they doing? <laughs> we have to learn from them, and of course, apply it to our own terrain. And that's what we're trying to do at People's Programs. Absolutely. And I think it's important you mention this because this is also a point of contention with a lot of um, even analysts who talk about how successful um, groups really are when it comes to seeking independence and um, self-sustainability, for example. This is something that, you know, whether it's black people or whether it's, you know, other liberation movements have often talked about is, oh, we um, have realized that the only way we can actually stand on our own feet and really expect that in the future we will have that liberation we're seeking is to gain that independence. That's also debated a lot, and it's debated often because it's saying, you know, uh, a power as large and as, you know, all-encompassing as the United States, for example, how are you going to battle that? Or how are you going to stand in front of it without being crushed eventually, especially given the huge imperialist footprint uh, that the U.S. has and the amounts of power it has and all of that? Um, how would you respond to those comments? I would rather struggle than live a life of just being complacent under oppression. I'd rather die <laughs> than live a life uh, under oppression and knowing that I didn't fight back against it. You know, so if people are just going to accept oppression, what makes you even better than the oppressor? <laughs> uh, and some people might even say, you know, to accept oppression and to know that there was oppression, that's a sin in itself. <laughs> and I ain't trying to sin. <laughs> so we have to also, uh, of course, it's a, it's a real thought pattern. We are dealing with the greatest enemy that... <laughs> Our time has ever known. We can argue, arguably say it's one of the greatest enemies of humanity, right? But if we don't try to win, we will never win. If we don't try to become free, we will never become free. So we have to engage in struggle. We have to engage in struggle. If we value humanity, if we value ourselves, if we value our families, if we value our communities, it is an obligation for us to struggle against the capitalist, racist, uh, imperialist machine in the United States, of America, that is the United States of America. For us Muslims, I see it as a religious obligation. If we understand that the Zionist usurping regime is essentially funded politically, socially, uh, economically, and militarily by the United States of America, if we aren't struggling against the United States of America, what does that make us? Because they are backing the Zionist regime that is uh, usurping our holy lands as Muslims, right? Uh, so. We have to have the courage. <laughs> we have to have the faith. Uh, we have to have a strong uh, spiritual integrity, right? We have to have, a, a, for me as a Muslim, a devotion to God and God's commands, right? If God commands us to struggle, <laughs> we must struggle against this uh, great Satan of the United States of America. That is just uh, incumbent upon us. Uh, so if you value freedom, if you value independence, uh, if you value humanity, <laughs> 
you will struggle against the United States of America. And we have to remove that fear from our heart, right? We have to remove that fear from our heart and, and dedicate our lives to paving a new pathway forward because uh, the blood has been spilled in this land. It has continued to spill in this land, but we got to stop that spilling. Absolutely. You know, and sometimes more blood has to be spilled for us to be free. Right. And, and I think this is a really relevant point to pivot to American elections, which is also something you have weighed in on, uh, speaking about the future of this country and really seeking to bring about that change. Um, one thing that you have said that I think is really important to speak about is in a lot of states right now, especially given the past year with Israel's war on Gaza, a lot of Muslims are turning away from, you know, the general democratic side of things and endorsing Green Party candidates like Jill Stein, um, who has been vocal about, you know, Palestine and against Israel and all of that. One thing that you said I think is interesting because I think it's somewhat of a different take on this topic is you have talked about how even these Green Party candidates are not ones that we should be endorsing because um, they essentially are on the same boat as the direction this nation is taking. There was a poll conducted by CARE in late August, I believe, where they found that in Michigan, 40% of Muslim voters were backing Stein. Or for example, um, she was also leading Harris among Muslims in Arizona and Wisconsin. Um, and obviously the numbers aren't significant enough to say this is going to kind of topple the duopoly that exists within our country, but you do have a significant amount of Muslims that are now saying, this is a better alternative and we are going to endorse these candidates. Mm. Um, but, you know, you have uh, chimed in on this. You have said that um, these are essentially what you call empire reformists and um, should not be the ones that we should be endorsing. Can you kind of expand on that? What do you mean by empire reformists? Well, we have to understand, again, I think this history of this country, the history of how this country was built, the history of this constitution that was written by white slaveholding men who had the teeth of enslaved people in the mouth. That is the rule of law of today. And the political system of the United States of America is a genocidal system. It's built off of the genocide of African people, built off the genocide of indigenous people, built off the enslavement of African people. So why would you want to integrate into a system that has only become more and more genocidal? Why would you want to become the head empire of chief of a nation that is dropping bombs all over the world? And why do you think that you could actually integrate into the system and stop it? <laughs> right? right. So part of the Green Party and this whole third party uh, nonsense is really about uh, integrating into the system and trying to, quote unquote, reform a system that has blood at the foundation, that has genocide at the foundation. If you look at the foundation of a tree, if its roots are corrupt, if its roots are rotten, that tree is going to be rotten. The United States of America will always be rotten and will always produce what it continues to produce. Uh, so thinking that the Green Party can come in and change things, again, uh, I, it's a lot of political theater. I also would uh, argue that it's a containment strategy. It's doing what you were talking about. It's making Muslims say, hey, we actually got, hey, we have a, another option the system. We could vote for Stein. Right. We could uh, have a, a Jewish president and a Muslim vice president. And this, this is a, an American dream. But that is just fooling people because that is not the reality. Thinking that, you know, a, a Jewish Green Party candidate and a Muslim uh, a Green Party candidate could come together uh, and fix the empire of the United States of America is like thinking that a two-state solution uh, will fix the issues in Philistine. Right. Uh, it's a containment strategy, many, uh, making us uh, believe into this system of electoral uh, politics. And this electoral system is always going to be a genocidal system. So the reality is we should be building our own systems. We should be building our own nation. We should be building our own political institutions, our own economic institutions, our own grocery stores, our own health clinics, have our own social charity wins to so we're able to take care of our nation and our communities the way we are supposed to. And if we could do that, we could become and realize that we could become our own liberators. Right. And I, I think I'm just going to challenge that point a bit, because one of the kind of dilemmas that a lot of Muslims right now are having is, you know, we are living uh, in America as much as we know the realities of, and the footprints of what this country has done, you know, domestically to its own people as well as abroad, we are living here. We are subject to its laws. We are seeing the massive repercussions of what, like, this country's foreign policy um, has on our own families abroad. Um, how would you say that that would work out if, for example, let's say you have a choice that could potentially decrease the you know, the genocidal footprint that this country has, 
or for example, make it somewhat better. Essentially, it is the idea of choosing wor the worst versus worst, but um, how, how do you think that that would play out if there at least, for example, is a candidate that could be that ray of hope, if you will, even if it's decreasing that legacy to a small amount, at least it's doing something. So how would you kind of speak about the dilemma of, okay, it's, it would be better, for example, if we had a president like Stein versus Trump or Kamala, which you know, are that you know, duopoly that exists within, within the American system itself. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, no, thank you for asking that. I think it's just, uh, for me, it's a question of what's actually real and what's not. Uh, there will never be a third party candidate in the United States of America right. who becomes president. Stein has no chance of becoming president. Right. It's just a fact. Cornell West has no chance of becoming president. The PSL candidate, they have no chance of becoming president. So my issue is that it provides uh, a false hope into this political system and then brainwashes us to believing that we should become a part of this political system, that we could actually uh, engage in this electoral process. Uh, the reality is... Uh, while we show, the, show up to the poll booths and the popular vote, the popular vote doesn't even matter. It's the Electoral College that is choosing the president of the United States of America. So in reality, we are making the choice. And I think also we must understand the president, uh, the so-called president, is in many ways a, a figurehead, right? right. Uh, we could look at the example right now of uh, uh, good old Joe Biden. <laughs> Joe Biden, who could barely walk by himself, barely talk by himself, uh, who is cognitively not functional, but look at how the American empire is working and functioning. So it just makes you ask yourself, okay, what is these uh, deep state actors? What are these corporate act actors, this corporate intelligence agency that is really calling the shots behind behind the scenes, right? So I think people uh, have that, and it's a good question to have is like, what do we do, right? Uh, because these presidents are already chosen by the corporations, right? It's chosen by the Electoral College. So this third party in itself, it will never work just based off of American politics and right. the way it is set up. Exactly. So my question is, for us to, uh, there is no harm reduction in evil. <laughs> evil was evil, whether it's Democrat or Republican. All right. Jill Stein, she has no chance of getting elected. But the best way that we can contribute is by building strong organizations here in this country. Is by why rely on this political process that we know is corrupt. I think we've got to ask ourselves, would we expect, can we expect the Zionist regime to reform itself by a quote unquote good Israeli voting for a less evil or voting for a third party? Could we expect the Zionist regime to reform itself or is the nature of the Zionist regime uh, immoral? Is the nature of the Zionist regime illegal? Is the nature of it a settler colony? And that's what the United States of America is. It's a settler colony. Right. These are settlers. They have no right to rule this land. And that is not just my law. That is, you know, international law. Uh, according to international law, colonization is illegal, right? Right. Uh, so what do we have the right to do as colonized people? We have the right to resist. Exactly. And I think that's that's also really important to speak about because you're absolutely right in saying that uh, the, I guess, two-party system here has been designed in a way where a third party actually succeeding in you know, making it is close to impossible. And we've seen that, you know, throughout American history, we've seen a lot of candidates, third party candidates attempt to do that, but it's just something that is a part of design the same way, like you mentioned, the electoral college and all of that. And this, this stuff is very much institutional and that is true. What do you think Muslims should be doing? And you mentioned obviously, you know, working independently, um, working from within, building organizations. We're talking about the same way, for example, you can have a third party candidate win elections and really, have that hope for institutional change. The same argument can be made about, you know, building these organizations that would actually be able to have an impact large enough where the Zionist chokehold, for example, that you're mentioning would be defeated in this country. So we're either talking about a very long period of time or a very sudden change that would really shake the entire nation and all of its foundations that have been in place for decades um, into ruin. So where do you think that responsibility is and what, if you were to say, was a practical way for Muslims to be approaching the elections and just leadership in this country? How do you think that would look like? Well, I think locally, you know, people can look in their different local cities and terrains and different propositions that are up for the ballot, uh, because I do think those have more of a day-to-day -day, uh, material impact in, in our community. 
rather than just focusing on who's going to be the next uh, genocide or in chief. So I do think people must become also politically active and understand their terrain, uh, and, you know, understand their school boards, understand the city council, understand who's running their mayor's office. Right. Uh, but at the same time, uh, that cannot be our only strategy. If we know that the foundation of the system is a settler colony, if this foundation of the system uh, is genocide, how are we going to stop uh, the genocide that is currently happening right now to black, brown, and indigenous people in this country. A tribunal in 2021, an international tribunal, found the United States guilty of genocide against black, brown, and indigenous people. And the genocide that is happening here to people here <laughs> that we often forget about uh, is fueling the genocide to Palestinians. It's fueling, uh, fueling the genocide against the Lebanese. So for us, it's very important that we build strong organizations. Right. If we build strong organizations, if we build strong communities, if we have strong families, right? Uh, if we have all these institutions, we can take care of ourselves. It's been shown. Resistance movements uh, had social charity wings, had their own hospitals, had their own food programs, right? Why don't we take uh, a look to history and understand our history and then apply it to the terrain that we're having now uh, and build our own independence? And this is a struggle that might take years, it might take decades. But we have to be willing to struggle, willing to sacrifice, and willing to fight for justice. We can't just sit back uh, because we get these breadcrumb, breadcrumbs from America and become complacent. That's the problem is we become too complacent uh, by all these shiny, glittery things in the United States of America that has us uh, pretty much brainwashed into believing that we should be American, even though we might say we're anti-American. Right. So we have to really decolonize our mind, uh, decolonize our ways of thinking, uh, decolonize our ideas of freedom and, and independence and ask ourselves, do we want to be free? Because freedom has to be fought for. Freedom has to be sacrificed for. Uh, freedom, if we want to be a free nation, <laughs> we have to be willing uh, to achieve martyrdom. So these are just these uh, simple truths that we must ask ourselves uh, and sit with those uh, questions and talk about these things amongst our communities and decide that we must build an alternative. We must build alternative power that is not integrated into the United States of America. If you think about the black radical tradition, everyone loves talking about Dr. Martin Luther King. Right. <laughs> right. Even the enemy. He's the most praised civil rights leader. Right. And when one of his last conversations that he had with Harry Belafonte, he said, I believe I have integrated my people into a burning house. So if the most praised assimilationist, if the most praised integrationist said, this house is on fire. <laughs> We can't even integrate into it. Why are we saying that we should integrate in 2024? You can't integrate into a genocidal regime. The genocide must be stopped. That's just the fact of the matter. And the United Nations isn't stopping the genocide. <laughs> Only the As people we've will seen, stop yeah. the genocide. So what are we going to do? What is our obligation to ourselves? What is our obligations to our families? Uh, what is our obligations to other believers? What is our obligations to Palestinians? What is our obligations to Africans? And are we going to fulfill our historic obligation uh, in struggling against a regime, against a genocidal empire? They never thought Rome would fall. <laughs> and Rome sure fell. Sure did. And people probably never thought the Soviet Union would fall. Soviet Union fell. And people never thought that America will fall. And inshallah, it falls as well. And what you're saying is actually, I think, a realization a lot of young people have been making as well. Um, one thing that we have seen a lot, especially in the media landscape, is young people turning away from mainstream outlets. You mentioned the, the whole breadcrumb analogy, and I think it's also very much relevant to the media where um, we have for so long been expecting, you know, and, and happy about those little breadcrumbs that the media throws with like, for example, oh, CNN talked about Palestine or the New York, the New York Times mentioned Palestine or they published this thing about, you know, all the, the deaths and the destruction that's happening there. And we feel subconsciously proud that, oh, wow, our mainstream media is suddenly now uh, operating on some moral compass, but essentially we see that, no, that's quite the opposite. It essentially means nothing when the entire uh, corporation is operating as a business and we know who the leaders of these corporations are. But I think, like you were mentioning, I think this is also a very interesting parallel to make between community organization and uh, self-sufficiency and independence. We also have been seeing a lot of that with a lot of independent media and um, kind of citizen journalists rising to talk about the realities of what's happening and realizing we can no longer rely on these institutions to represent us when we have so much hope. And again, you know, we're being fed breadcrumbs 
um, and we have this expectation, but we're slowly starting to realize that it's never really going to change unless we want to do something about it. And I think that was a really powerful point you mentioned. Um, one thing that also stood out to me about uh, some of the conversations that we've had we've had so far is your mention of your religion um, as a Muslim in you know informing a lot of you know your activism and the work that you have done. What if I can ask, sparked your uh, revision to Islam. How did that journey start for you? And what role do you think that um, joining Islam and becoming a Muslim had in the work that you are doing today? I think it's such a war on the spirit. <laughs> it's such a war on the spirit in, the, in this country and, and seeing the level of spiritual uh, deprivation that this country has day in, day out. You know, it, it's something that I felt, especially, uh, uh, trying to do this work, right? Uh, trying to uh, build strong communities, trying to, uh, uh, you know, essentially uh, combat <laughs> the so-called United States of America. Uh, it, it's work that is very daunting. You know, it's work that is uh, very difficult, uh, can be very depressing, right? Uh, but I'd say as part of my journey, you know, I've always been searching for truth. I think that's why I got involved as a young activist on UC Berkeley's campus, joining the Black Student Union, I, I got involved because I was in search for truth and I was against evil, right? Uh, and in my search for truth, you know, I, I had to figure out like, what, what is this world? <laughs> what is the, the meaning of life? You know, right. kind of those uh, existential questions that you might have about exactly. yourself, right? Um, but again, as I was learning of history, again, going back to history, uh, and I was learning about different revolutions across the world and studying different revolutions. I was like, what is one of the revolutions that kicked off uh, the decolonial struggle uh, in, in the African context, context and continent, of course, right? Uh, it's the Algerian revolution, right? And I'm like, what is the Algerian revolution? What is it significant? And, okay, it's an Islam, it was an Islamic revolution, right? And then you see the Black Panther Party being inspired by the Algerian revolution, right? You see the Black Panther Party being inspired by the words of El Hajj Melk El Shabazz, uh, and saying that, you know, we, the Huey and Bobby pretty much were explaining that they brought the words of Malcolm into life and into fruition, right, uh, through the Black Panther Party, right? Uh, they said if it wasn't for the Black Muslims, <laughs> right, there wouldn't be any programs that the Black Panther Party had, right? So for me, just understanding history, understanding revolt against colonizers, but also going back to West Africa. A lot of the West Africans were Muslims, right, um, who were victims of uh, this continued crusade, right? And who was resisting the most? It was the African Muslims, you know? Uh, and Haiti, who was resisting? It was African Muslims. And West Africa, who was resisting? It was African Muslims. And the so-called United States South, uh, who was resisting? It was African Muslims. The African Muslims were resisting so much that some of these slave traders was like, hey, don't bring no more African Muslims. We don't need none of them because they is, they is waging struggle, <laughs> a waging struggle against us and making our jobs very hard. Uh, so what I found uh, was the truth of Islam in terms of its resistance to tyranny, in terms of its uh, resistance to oppression. And I just felt the love and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I just, it was, you know, it's just the, the spiritual energy uh, and, and the emotion that I felt. It was just like a, a new part of my, my soul was unlocked. Um, and it was through that struggle. You know, it was being in some of those darkest times of my life where I found God, you know. Um, so ultimately, I, I, I uh, understand Islam as a revolutionary religion, if you want to put it into <laughs> the terms of today. Right? right. Absolutely. But ultimately, it's a revolution of self, the revolution of our own heart. Right. Uh, you know, that, that greater jihad. And uh, I wasn't always living the right way, <laughs> you know, uh, not to expose my past sins. Right. But uh, drinking and partying, that's something that the West wants to put on, you, you know, but since I took shot, I ain't never touched any of that. You know, so uh, I think that's the, the blessing of Islam is that it gives you the spiritual discipline uh, to be able to struggle the right way. And that's the big thing. We have to ask ourselves, how do we struggle the right way? Uh, and Islam that provides a compass for the right form of struggle, right? Uh, and ultimately, you know, it, it helps us reject this material, uh, worldly life, you know, it provides us uh, immaterial within our souls uh, that allows us to struggle in a way uh, that is aligned for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So every day I try to remind myself, why am I struggling? It's for the sake of God, I could all, only be victorious. Absolutely. If I'm doing it for that. So it's, it's been a journey to say the least. Yeah, and, and that's very inspiring actually to hear you say that. And I think um, another thing that's really inspiring about your story is you actually recently 
partook in the Arbain Walk, the annual Arbain Walk in Karbala, Iraq, which is the largest public gathering that happens in the world. Um, I'm curious to know about your experience with that. What, first of all, drove you to want to partake in that? And um, what were some of the things that you experienced while embarking on that journey? Yeah, even, you know, you bringing me up, bring that question up is, uh, is something that uh, makes me emotional. Uh, you, you know, it's just uh, experiencing the level of humanity the way I did, experiencing the way people love and the devotion that they have to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, experiencing the love that people have for Imam Hussein, alayhi salam. It's something that is, you can't quantify it. <laughs> it surpasses the level of materialism where it's so immaterial, but it is so felt in such a material way. Right. Uh, it's just life changing. Uh, so for what led me to want to go, you know, uh, when I changed my name, you know, uh, a brother, a brother of mine uh, named Amir, you know, uh, I took Shahada and, you know, everyone was like, hey, man, you got to change your name, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So people, you know, all, all different names are being shouted out. And he said, hey, brother, you know, I think you should take the name Abbas. And he said, I want you to look up uh, the Battle of Karbala and look up, uh, you know, what Abbas did for his family, uh, the sacrifices he made, right? Uh, getting water, you know, which to us might seem like such a simple thing. We got to understand Abbas was a warrior. <laughs> you know, he was a warrior, right? He wanted to be on the battlefield, but he chose to get that water because it was commanded upon him. He chose to make that ultimate sacrifice uh, for the sake of God, uh, for the sake of Islam, uh, for the sake of his family, and against tyranny and oppression of that society. And you know, for me, the story of Abbas ibn Ali alayhi salam. Uh, and trying to apply that to my own life, my own struggle, you know, and, you know, because we're, we're out here in Oakland giving out water, uh, out here in Oakland giving out food, out here in Oakland trying to support people. Uh, and we're struggling in many ways against the, the modern tyrant of our time, right? Absolutely. Uh, so for me, that choosing that name was very special. Uh, and ultimately, um, going to Arbaeen and, and visiting, you know, uh, Hazrat Abbas, uh, alayhi salam, and being in the land and being where he was and being where he was martyred and praying on that ground and, and seeing the people like when I chose the name, I had no idea how significant it was. Right. And even five years from now, as my knowledge expands and my heart grows and uh, I'll, experience, I'll you know reflect upon this experience that I've had and I'll be even greater. But uh, being able to go there and to commemorate the martyrdom of the Imam Hussein alayhi salam uh, at the Bar Battle of uh, Karbala and uh, seeing the love that people have for him and seeing the oath of allegiance people have for him and seeing how uh, that binds the resistance together and, and creates a different spiritual strength uh, to where we're struggling against these modern Yazids of our time. Uh, being able to experience that spiritual energy and when we uh, are able to uh, uh, honor and commemorate our martyrs, not just solely in mourning, but also in avenging. <laughs> Uh, it's a spiritual energy that uh, I think the world should see, especially for us uh, here inside the belly of the beast, seeing the level of self-reliance that the Iraqi people have developed despite decades of war, decades of uh, U.S. occupation, uh, dealing with uh, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, right? And the way they become self-reliant and they give up everything they have to serve, serve pilgrims for Imam Hussein alayhi salam, and they sacrifice so much just to provide for people that's why i, I know it's possible <laughs> i've seen it yeah i've seen self-reliance i've seen true community i've seen the true love but it's that uh that spirituality it's that deepness of it it's that deepness of the love for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's the deepness of saying never again uh to being uh, uh, uh humiliated right um that's you know it was an incredible experience absolutely and it's really interesting that you say that a lot of people who um, go and come back, say very similar things about the spirit of, first of all, the spirit of unity and not just seeing uh, Shia Muslims partaking in that walk, which a lot of people expect and many kind of try to uh, paint that as a propaganda where, oh, this is just a bunch of Shia countries coming together. And, you know, it's really interesting because you have so many people across different walks of life, not just Muslim. Yes who have embarked on this journey and they all come back saying the same, saying the same thing, especially when you look at the background 
kind of inspiration behind why a lot of these people are embarking on this journey, it's very much rooted in this idea of what did Imam Hussein stand for? And if mm -hmm. we were to relate his message centuries ago to what's happening today, what is the Karbala of our time? If you were to kind of reflect on this journey that you had, and if you were to relate that message of Imam Hussein and, you know, Hazrat Abbas, who you uh, named yourself after, what would you say the Karbala of today really looks like? Well, I want to speak to something just real quick before I, I get into that, especially when you're talking about uh, that it isn't only uh, uh, the Shias who commemorate uh, uh, Arba'in, right. you know, who, who, who make that pilgrimage. And I had the chance to stay at the Palestinian Mokeb, and the Mokebs are different uh, little areas where people can rest, get food, there's shelter, air conditioning, and, you know, the call to prayer came. And I saw Shias searching for Sunnis to pray behind, searching for Palestinians to pray behind. You know, so when people talk about the sectarianism and all this, I'm like, you you haven't seen what this is. <laughs> you see the the, the exactly. level of love or the level of unity that uh, Imam Hussein, you know, uh, binds us with, <laughs> right? Exactly. Uh, it was one of the most beautiful experiences to to, to witness uh, things like that, witness the love and witness uh, the unity of those under La Ilaha Illallah. Um, you know, so I think we have to take the the, the parallels. Uh, uh, the Battle of Karbala. We have to take it, right? Uh, if we say, say we uh, uh, understand the school of Karbala, you know, we got to understand uh, how that shows up today, right? Uh, you know, because the oppression of this land, <laughs> uh, the oppression of people, right? Uh, the constant mourning that we are having for our martyrs, it is happening day in and day out. Day exactly. in and day out. Uh, but I think it gives us a great example for an earlier question that you had is, uh, talking about how we are struggling against one of the biggest uh, usurping forces, one of the most evil forces uh, known to human history. But what did Iman Hussein do on the Battle of Kabul? Nearly 75 people fighting against an army. <laughs> exactly. Way greater in size, right? And there was victory in that. Even if most of uh, most of the people were martyred, there was victory in that. And still today, a thousand plus years later, we were citing this as an example. Today, a thousand years later, that is uh, essentially part of the heartbeat of the resistance, right? Absolutely. Uh, so we have to take those lessons and apply it to ourselves, right? Uh, even if we're against the uh, uh, enemy that is stronger, <laughs> even if we're against the enemy who uh, might appear quote unquote, <laughs> uh, to say they're a Muslim, right? Uh, we will struggle for justice. Uh, we will struggle uh, to bring truth into a society. And ultimately, uh, we are willing to be killed for our beliefs in justice, for our belief that uh, humanity has the right to dignity, that humanity has the right uh, to live a life worthy of freedom. So that is uh, how I would, would uh, connect it today. Thank you so much, Brother Montagrim. Thank you for, first of all, being my guest today and for your inspiring words. I really learned so much from you and um, thank you for giving us your time. No, oh, thank you for having me. It's uh, truly been an honor and, and uh, you know, keep up the good work. Y'all are doing some great work in terms of uh, providing independent coverage, uh, and independent truth, you know, and, and waging that because we, we people need the truth. <laughs> Absolutely. We need the truth day in and day out. So uh, may Allah reward you for all all y'all good deeds and may uh, Allah continue to bless uh, the business and uh, your truth tell, inshallah. Thank you so much.